All right. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Today's talk, Utilizing Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy with Preschool-Aged Children. Um, I think this is a topic of interest to a lot of people, so I'm really excited that um, we have a great speaker for you all today, Stephanie John. She's going to introduce herself here in just a minute. In just a minute. A few housekeeping items. If you need to ask a question during the presentation, use the chat feature, which is found on the right side of your screen, and uh, we will address those questions as they come up. And if you'd like to earn um, a CU, you'll need to email the code that is given at the end of this webinar. So don't leave early. Uh, the last, the very last slide will have that information on there for that. And this is just a reminder that we are recording this webinar and we'll upload the presentation to our website. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to our speaker today. Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Sussna John and I work um, at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences um, Psychiatric Research Institute. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here. Um, I work with the Our Best program, and I also work with the Arkansas NEST program, which is the Network for Early Stress and Trauma, um, that also focuses on children zero to five um, with a couple different evidence-based interventions. Um, so really, what we've been learning more and more is that many of us have had um, kind of a gap in our training or a lack of familiarity with how to implement um, mental health services with kids so young. And I think for a lot of times, um, we just weren't trained in what to consider when treating these young kids. So what I'm hopeful today will give you is a review of development um, and how it is typically um, presenting in children ages three to five years. We'll talk about the trauma prevalence in this age group because they are certainly a vulnerable population, both in Arkansas and nationally. And then we'll discuss the strategies for implementing the various TFCBT components with young children. Um, please feel free to put in any questions as I'm talking, so don't feel like you need to wait until the end to do that. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have um, as we go through. Okay, so why discuss development to begin with? I know we're all on here to talk specifically about TFCBT with preschoolers, but in order to do work with preschoolers, you need to kind of get where they're at. Um, and what understanding development does is first helps you determine whether TFCBT is even an appropriate intervention for you to choose. So we know that TFCBT is evidence-based for children ages 3 through 17, so up to age 18. Um, but many 3-year-olds that come to our clinic aren't developmentally 3. So what we really look for also in addition to chronological age is developmental age. Um, it'll help you sharpen your ability to identify children that may need other early intervention services, such as speech-language therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. Um, many of my young kiddos are also in adjunct services like that, and we see huge benefits for their mental health um, for them being in those other developmental services. I'm hoping that this will enhance your own clinical knowledge um, and your ability to communicate with parents about what they should expect from their three- to five-year-old children. Um, I know I don't have to tell you that parents often come into therapy with unrealistic expectations of what their child should be doing or should not be doing, um, and I think this is definitely the case for young children. Um, and finally, knowing development will help you choose appropriate strategies within each component of TFCBT. A common question we get is, how in the world would you do cognitive coping with a three-year-old? And we'll talk about what can you expect cognitively from a three-year-old, and that will help you choose then how would you do this intervention. So luckily we're not alone in this um, quest for knowledge. There are several excellent resources to educate yourself and parents about developmental milestones. Um, two of my favorites are listed here. Um, zero to three and CDC gov and um, those pictures are fact sheets that the cdc.gov website has. They have them um, split up in months for early childhood all the way through five years. I love these handouts um, and actually much of the information I'm presenting you today will be coming from these handouts and we'll talk about how to use them with parents. Um, they are both in English and Spanish as well on the website. They're completely free to use and you could actually through the website request a whole stack of them to be sent to your clinic. Um, so you don't even have to print them. So they're really, really helpful strategies um, to share with parents and take home. 
So what does a three-year-old look like developmentally? So of course, um, you know, a caveat, when we talk about development, um, development is a continuum. And so um, it's not that every three-year-old is doing all of these tasks at the same rate all the time. What you're really looking for is this is generally what they should be doing at age three. Um, and if they're not doing these things, that may be a concern. Um, and another thing I really like about those CDC handouts is they have a little box on each of them that says, if your child's not doing this, here's here's when you need to get some help. So it'll talk about different areas within development that, you know, if your child's not walking by this age, you should probably talk with somebody about helping them out. So um, I've included a lot of tasks in here. Some more than others are relevant to mental health. Um, socially and emotionally, what we expect from three-year-olds is that they will be mimicking adults and friends. Um, they would be showing affection without prompting, they're starting to learn how to take turns, show concerns for others in pain, which is those building blocks of empathy we're looking for. They're starting to understand the concept of personal belongings. And what that means is this is mine and this toy is yours. Um, so a lot of times with parents when they talk about, you know, I don't know why she doesn't respect her property or I don't know why she doesn't treat other people's toys with care. Remember, that's a skill that's just starting to develop for these kids, understanding that, oh, this is mine versus this is yours. Three-year-olds, um, not surprisingly, tend to show a pretty wide range of emotions, actually. Um, they should be separating fairly easily by now, um, and you do tend to normally get distress over changes in the routine. I think this one is probably the most important one that I use in psychoeducation with parents um, because for parents, for us, it doesn't really seem like a huge deal if this night we have to brush your teeth later than we have to read your bedtime story because older brother is in the bathroom right now. But for younger kids, um, routines is what helps to establish emotional safety and security, and they will notice changes in the routine, and actually it's often accompanied by pretty upset feelings. And so helping to normalize that for parents. So you don't have a super sensitive kid, you might just have a three-year-old, and that's typical of what a three-year-old would do. And then you can help them with strategies of how to prevent disruptions in their routine or when disruptions in the routine must happen, um, how do you help prep your kids to make them as least distressing as possible. So language and communication-wise, these kiddos are starting to follow two to three step instructions. What that means is um, pick up your toy, come to me, and put it in the box. Not all three-year-olds, though. So again, when parents are giving multiple instructions, like clean your room, which probably is associated with 10 or 15 different things kids have to do, that's not necessarily developmentally appropriate. They should be able to know their own name, age, and sex, name friends, speak well enough for strangers to understand what is being said, and carry on conversations of two to three sentences. So right there, that should tell you, oh, I might need to do therapy a little differently with a three-year-old. So if they can carry on conversations of two to three sentences, long, drawn-out conversations might not necessarily be helpful for this age group. Sorry, I'm just looking at a um, chat here just to make sure if we can do something about some sound issues. Okay. So... Um, when you carry on conversations, what this should let you know is for younger kids, hands-on activities are definitely preferable to long, drawn-out conversations. Cognitively, um, they're, used, they're starting to play make-believe, which should give you a really good idea of things you can try play strategies-wise to implement these skills. Um, they can turn pages on a book. Um, they can turn door handles, which is an important thing to think about when we're talking about just basic safety. So these kids are getting to the point where actually they can start to um, move around and negotiate their worlds a little better. Um, and finally, as we know about three-year-olds, running, pedaling, climbing, um, this is an active age group for many kids. And so um, parents shouldn't be surprised if their three-year-old is climbing all over the place or running. That doesn't necessarily mean we will help them to manage that in a safe manner. It's more of just helping parents to get a good idea um, of developmental expectations. 
So then when we move to four-year-olds, um, four-year-olds love doing new things. They like playing mommy and daddy, and they have increased creativity during their make-believe play. Um, one thing I think is really important socially and emotionally about this age group is they may have some difficulty differentiating between real and make-believe. This may be incredibly important when you get to the narrative. So um, a lot of our parents get really stuck when the things that kids say in their narrative aren't exactly the way it happened. So it may be the way that people remember it happening, um, and our memories aren't a photograph. Um, but this is especially true for young kids um, who have difficulties with differentiating time and the order of things, what's real, what's make-believe. There may be things in their narrative that you really have to explain to parents. It's not that, that your kid is lying or not telling the truth. It may just be this is the way their minds interpreted what happened for them. Language and communication-wise, um, they enjoy telling stories, which is great for their narrative, and at this point they should know their first and last name. And things like that are important when we talk about establishing safety. Um, cognitively, there are some of the milestones listed for you. They're starting to understand time here. So things like timelines can really help you to organize kids in this age group. And then finally, movement, not surprisingly, they're still on the go. Um, and so they can start actually taking care of some of those um, self-care things related to food with supervision. Um, and what you'll see a running theme here is that um, we talk to parents about what you should expect, but also what you'll need to step in on and help kids in terms of safety and supervision. And then finally, when we get to five-year-olds, um, a lot of five-year-olds have this innate desire to please friends and to be like their friends. And so um, I have a lot of parents say, well, you know, if all those people jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? Maybe. So really with five-year-olds, they want to fit in. They want to be like their friends. They're more likely to do things if their friends are doing them. And so that helps parents to understand, I need to supervise and monitor peer interactions pretty strongly just to make sure that what's going around the friend group um, is appropriate because my kid's likely to pick them up. They're aware of gender. They can now differentiate between real and make-believe in a better way. Um, and they show more independence and a desire for more independence. And so your child's not necessarily being strong-willed as a five-year-old when they want to do it by themselves. That's actually normal developmentally and something we'd want to encourage. Language and communication-wise, they're speaking more clearly, they're starting to get tenses, and here's when we see them saying their name and address. I, mean, I know I keep bringing up um, these demographic things, but I think when we talk about physical safety and safety plans with children, um, them knowing their name and address can be incredibly important. Cognitively, they're starting to be able to write. Um, a lot of narrative work in this age group is done through play, it's done through art. Um, I encourage you not to get so caught up in the mechanics of doing the narrative that you lose sight of what the narrative process is actually about, which is processing trauma. And we'll talk more about those strategies when we get to the second half of this presentation. And finally, um, with movement, they are showing increased balance, still swinging and climbing about. Um, they should be toileting independently at this point. So what is the connection between trauma and development? So trauma early in life has a tendency to disrupt typical development. It's kind of this missing stair in this staircase towards normative um, development. Um, and as such, many trauma symptoms early in childhood may manifest as developmental difficulties. So one of the things I want you to consider when you're doing um, an intake is to ask about development in a pretty substantial way. Ask about toileting changes, ask about sleeping changes, eating changes, changes with how they process sensory information. Sometimes we leave that to the MDs and PCPs in our life, but these can really be the way that trauma symptoms manifest in young children. Um, and remember, when you know what's typical, you can then determine what's not typical and you can help to implement behavior strategies or refer to outside services when they're necessary. So within Arkansas, what I've done is given you 
the rates of trauma prevalence in Arkansas. This is the latest um, NCAN study um, that was published here in 2015. It's based on 2013 results. What they basically do is survey every state, and the state provides them with a huge amount of information. I've listed the link down here because I think this is a really helpful website. Um, so it's a huge report. It gives you statistics about all sorts of mandated reports who the offenders are, were they founded, what age groups, what types of offenses. Um, so when we talk about psychoeducation and giving parents um, some insight, and kids as well, into how difficult or common these things are, we can rely on, on NCAMS data as well as NCTSN um, handouts. So roughly 20% of the child maltreatment reports in the state of Arkansas in 2013 were for children ages three to five years. And so this is a heavily traumatized group. Um, that's equivalent to almost 2,000 children, um, and that's unique children, and a rate of 16 to 17 per 1,000 Arkansan children. And this rate exceeds the national average. So the national average for this age group is 10 to 11 per 1,000 children. So unfortunately, Arkansan children um, are showing a greater rate of trauma than we see nationally. And so there are a lot of common misperceptions, and I will be the first to admit I was guilty of a lot of these even being trained in mental health at first. And so um, one of the really common ones is young children may not remember trauma, and so they may not be affected by trauma because they're young. So um, we have a specialized program at the Child Study Center that really looks at children who are zero to five, and I wanted to share some information that we've collected on these kids. Um, so 75% of the kids we look at show clinically significant levels of emotional and behavioral symptoms. More than a third show clinically significant PTSD symptoms. 86% of their caregivers report significant parenting stress in managing these children. So I think we can argue pretty effectively, actually, that indeed children are affected by these traumatic experiences even when they're young. Um, sometimes we have this idea that very young children are inherently resilient. You know young kids, they'll bounce back. Um, and unfortunately, what we know is trauma can have a significant impact on development and long-term consequences, even for young children. Those are consequences for mental health, for your ability to form relationships with other people. And interestingly, now we're discovering more and more your physical health as well. Um, another common misperception is if we just don't talk about it, kids are going to move on. Um, and what we know, unfortunately, is PTSD symptoms don't tend to magically improve. So a lot of times what we see is they may maintain, they may even worsen over time without intervention. Remember, a core symptom of PTSD is avoidance. And so when we don't talk about it, we're actually contributing to one of the core symptoms of PTSD. And finally, what are you supposed to do in therapy with a very young child? And in fact, there are several evidence-based treatments for children under the age of five, including TSCBT, which is for children ages three and up. So those are common misperceptions that you might have, but that I bet some of your parents have as well. So there'll be things you'll want to address directly within psychoeducation. But identifying these kids can be tough. So symptoms of trauma, particularly in young children, often mimic all sorts of other disorder symptoms. And it's challenging because it's really hard to establish what a child looked like prior to trauma exposure, um, either because we don't have great informants for that time in their life, if these kids are DCFS in, um, or in a different home, or because the trauma started so early that really there wasn't a whole lot of time to establish a baseline of how they were doing before trauma exposure. Um, therefore, crucial, crucial, crucial to consider trauma and stressor-related disorders when diagnosing these children. So I could get on a soapbox about this, but what I will say, um, just to keep it short and concise, is that the diagnosing can be powerful because it's the lens through which other people view this child. And so when we think about what lens do I want someone to look at this child with? Do I want them to look like a child who's been through a lot that's having trouble adjusting to big events? Or do I want them to look like a child who just has oppositional and behavior problems and is doing this on purpose? Um, so think about that kind of when you're diagnosing as well. And it's often prudent to diagnose an adjustment mm -hmm. disorder and then rule out for other conditions once trauma symptoms have been resolved. 
So questions to consider when you're diagnosing. Um, did the child's symptoms emerge or worsen without trauma exposure? Can I be sure that these symptoms are independent from trauma? Or how might these presenting symptoms match up with the new DSM-5 criteria for PTSD? So that new criteria is for children under the age of six years. It's not necessarily that there are huge differences in the specific criteria themselves. It's more of the number of criteria that are needed in different areas. So you need two for hyperarousal, at least one of either avoidance or negative alterations in cognition and mood, and one symptom at least in intrusion. So I encourage you to take a look at that new criteria. Um, one of the easiest ways, or I guess most helpful ways I've found to, to answer these questions for myself is to do a timeline within an intake with parents. So to see when did you start seeing these symptoms and when did these behavior problems happen and then when did trauma happen. Um, so I've had many sessions where parents just really haven't noticed that pattern until it's laid out for them. Like, oh, you're telling me that you started noticing that your son was more argumentative and angry at two. Ah, I see here that you and dad um, were having a lot of problems during that time and then just leaving it there. And sometimes I think a lot of parents, that's a light bulb for them in terms of, oh, I guess I just never realized that. Particularly because remember, parents often are in the midst of their own trauma with these joint traumas, and it's harder for them to notice the impact it can have on other people when they themselves are going through something. So I'm hopeful that that gives you kind of an adequate background on early childhood development and diagnosing difficulties that might, you know, occur in this age group. But what I really wanted to focus this latter half of the presentation on is how does this look within TFCBT? So here are the PRAC components um, that you're seeing down here as well as um, the rest of the model. So the practice acronym is here. I don't think this is surprising to anyone, um, but we'll go through each component individually. But some general guidelines first. So hands-on experiences work very well with young children. If there's a way to do it instead of talk about it, I encourage you to do that. Um, including caregivers within sessions. So I know that we talk about this traditional split of at least having half the time with caregivers and half the time with children within TFCBT, which is a strength of the model. I think this balance shifts even more towards having caregivers included with younger children. Um, and that's because if, if parents aren't in the room, they don't know necessarily what you're doing with these young kids. And young kids may not be able to explain these concepts very well to parents. So that really helps them understand what's happening and how to reinforce those skills at home. So I found that psychoeducation may play a larger role for young kids. And remember, that's about dispelling common myths and increasing parent engagement. Um, a three-year-old is probably not going to tell their parents over and over again that they are in need of therapy services and want to come. They, hopefully, they enjoy coming. So you're really relying even more so on parent engagement here. Um, model positive parenting techniques for caregivers. And um, I think this is really important across the lifespan, but particularly for younger kids. Model praise. And model praise not only for kids, but for parents, too. So, Mom, I love the way you got right down on the floor with us in our playing. Or, um, kiddo, thank you for putting away those toys when I asked you to. You did that right away. And so helping parents to develop that language that we know helps with these behaviors. And then finally, having fun. So play is the natural language of kids. If you're not willing to get goofy and silly and um, a little active with your kids, you're, you're going to lose them. So really trying to be developmentally appropriate, even within yourself, and how you approach this population. Okay. So with psychoeducation, um, that's not only psychoeducation about trauma symptoms and about TFCBT, but also why it's important to do trauma work with such a young child. There's a couple of analogies I use with parents within TFCBT that you may find helpful. Um, the first is this idea of cups. Um, and so what we talk about with trauma is kids have a little cup, and that cup can get can overflow really easily. They have a smaller ability to kind of tolerate difficult and big emotions and big events in their life. And that's not only just developmental, that's biological. So a lot of these kids, their systems have not yet developed the skills to be able to regulate the difficulties that they're experiencing. So what we tell parents is, 
what you do is you are a cup outside of their cup, kind of like a nested cup, and their overflow, you're there to catch it. And that's why it's really important that you're so involved in this therapy is you're going to be the one that catches that overflow. And then I, I usually take it a step further, and if your cup gets overflowed, hopefully my cup will be able to catch your overflow too and other people in your life. And really helping to build a sense of teamwork with parents. Um, another analogy that we use very commonly in TFCBT that I think is effective for young children as well is that wound cleaning analogy, the idea that you have this wound and we could treat the surface of the wound and not really pay attention to the deeper causes, um, but you're going to get infected. Um, but we know cleaning out a wound can hurt, and sometimes trauma therapy can hurt. It can be hard to do. This is not easy work. But... After you clean out a wound, you'll still have a scar, but scars don't hurt when you touch them. And talking about how I'm never going to be able to erase this memory for your family, but hopefully we can help your child um, to move forward in a more healthy way. You can consult um, NCTSN. Um, that's the National Childhood Traumatic Stress Network. Um, NCTSN.org um, have great handouts about what trauma symptoms look like in preschool-age children. The CDC also has handouts related to development. Um, a significant portion of psychoeducation for these families may need to be parent-only. So that way parents understand how to be supportive and what to look for when we do this with children. But I am a firm believer that psychoeducation also needs to happen with young children, even children who are three. So some of the ways we can do that, I've included just an example. So we know that you've been through scary things, like seeing your mommy and daddy fight, being hungry and not having enough food, or an adult touching your private parts. You and your mom are coming here to help you deal with those big feelings that might happen after scary things you've been through. So we don't practice avoidance within our clinic either. And what we do is recognize this has happened to children, and they need the words and a voice to be able to talk about it. I love using books with young kids um, because oftentimes books can help you articulate something that you're not quite sure how to explain um, in easier language. There are tons of books that we really like to use within our clinic, but some of my personal favorites I've listed here below. Some address foster care, parental incarceration, general violence, sexual abuse. Um, and again, NCTSN can have some great resources in terms of book lists as well as the MUSC website where you did that TFCBT online initial training, they also have resources listed um, related to books. Oh, I should mention one more thing about books. Um, I tend to read books with the parent alone before I read them with the child. So I always want to be respectful of parents' cultural values and have them make sure they understand the content of what we're going to be talking about um, before kind of presenting these to children. Okay. So parenting is likely going to be a significant portion of treatment for young children. Um, parents rarely come to the clinic because their child is having post-traumatic symptoms. They usually come because my child's defiant, they won't mind me, they're aggressive, they're sad or fussy. And so we want to really help parents to support those behaviors, um, to help kids get more regulated, but also to keep parents engaged and to reduce the functional impairment. Oh, thanks, Lisa. Um, so Lisa just sent out a message to everybody also about a really good book for elementary age children, which is wonderful. Um, I'm actually going to write that down when I get a chance because I always like looking at those new resources. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so what we want to work on is consistency as much as we can between caregivers. So you not only talk about strategies with parents at home, but maybe with grandparents. Maybe at school, what are the daycare providers doing? What are preschool teachers doing? Um, and try to obtain collateral information from daycare and school providers, um, particularly regarding triggers and how they manage misbehavior. So. Um, just to give you an example of one of my own cases, I was working with a five-year-old child um, who was really doing pretty great at home with their foster parent, but for some reason at school was having significant difficulties in the morning. In the afternoon, he was back to being great, but mornings were really tough. So we went through, is he sleeping okay? What's his nutrition like? All those developmental things seemed to be going well. 
So I talked with the school, and indeed, just like Foster Mom said, it seemed to be almost like a light switch where afternoon hit and he was a lot better. So I asked them, does anything change at school around that time? And they said, actually, that's a shift change for us. So we have morning staff and we have afternoon staff. Um, and, you know, come to think of it, he has particular difficulties with this one morning staff person. They're really hard. And it turned out that person um, looked a lot like this kiddo's biological mom. And for him, that was a real challenge. It was a real trigger for him. And so that's not something that we probably would have figured out just through talking to the foster parent. So I encourage you um, to really obtain that collateral information, get those releases signed, and talk to daycare and school providers. Um, normalize to parents whenever possible. This is a tough age group to parent, regardless of if they've had trauma experiences or not. Um, Three-year-olds are tough. <laughs> they can be really challenging. And um, oftentimes parents will tell me things like, see, I don't know why you're not bothered right now, or how come you're being so patient? And I could get on a high horse and go, well, it's because I have all this training. But instead what I usually say is, mom, I'm done in an hour. So I have to deal with this for one hour. You have to deal with this for the whole week. So I can imagine we probably have different thresholds of how patient we are with things. How can I work with you to develop more patience or develop um, a better rapport with your kids? Um, and I really try to steer parents away from language that is um, negative. So things like my child is really manipulative. So I'm sure all of you have heard of those three-year-olds that are super manipulative. She knows exactly what she's doing. She purposely does this. Um, and one strategy I use with parents is, as human beings, we all use the strategies we know work. I give an, them an example of when I was growing up as a kid, um, my mom would set all kinds of rules that my dad was kind of like the fun dad. And so he'd be like, it's cool, you can do what you want. And so what I knew is if I wanted to do something, I'm going to dad to ask, right? Dad's going to be the one that will say yes. Is that manipulative? I mean, I guess I am manipulating the situation I'm in, but really what I'm doing is using a strategy that works. So for parents, it's about if you don't want that strategy anymore, stop letting it work. Because kids are really smart. What your kid is showing us is they've learned that this strategy equals the outcomes I want. They could easily learn as well that this strategy no longer gets me the outcomes I want. But just like all habits, habits took years to develop, and they're not going to go away overnight. So really encouraging your parents to have realistic, small-step, um, objective ways to measure if their kids are getting better. So relaxation. Um, I think hyperarousal is a really important symptom cluster to talk with young um, parents of young children about particularly because, remember, a certain level of hyperactivity and impulsivity and impaired concentration, that's normal for young children. But with children with trauma, hyperarousal symptoms can really um, exaggerate those symptoms. Um, what I tell parents is that I think of your child as a pot of boiling water with the lid on. They're constantly on simmer. Their bodies are on simmer. And so for them, it takes not too much to happen for them to boil over. Where for other kids, it would take them a whole lot more. That's what trauma does to your body. It puts you on simmer. And I've seen some parents respond really well to that idea of, oh, um, that's why my kid seems to freak out over even very small things that happen. Discussing trauma triggers within relaxation, both external and internal triggers. I think we miss internal triggers a lot with parents. So we talk about externally, oh, if this, they see this person, if they see a police car, it might remind them of things. But internal triggers, when your child feels out of control, that might be a trigger for them. When they've been crying for a long time and that feeling you get of exhaustion after you've cried your, your eyes out, that might be a trigger for them. And that's not something you would see necessarily from the outside. Teaching relaxation to children and parents together. This can be a beautiful way to do some joint co-regulation. Um, frankly, a lot of the parents we deal with could really benefit from relaxation skills themselves. Um, I love relaxation skill sessions because I often find that I benefit from doing relaxation skills with my kiddos as well. And so you can do deep breathing. Um, there's this cute as a button book. Um, I've 
the covers right here, it's called Breathe. It's about this little whale, um, and it teaches parents and kids how to breathe really deep together. Um, you can do blowing bubbles, which is great for regulation, or the warm cookies example. Um, I actually got this example from one of the people on my TFCBT consultation call. So if you're on this presentation right now, thanks. I use it all the time with my kids. Um, but what it is is you can tell kids to imagine they have a plate of warm cookies in front of them, and they have to breathe in really deep in order to be able to smell those cookies. But, ooh, they're hot. You have to blow them out, and so they blow out that breath really slow. Um, and I found that can be a really fun one for kids. Um, progressive muscle relaxation you can do with young kids. Um, you can do dry noodles versus cooked noodles, tin mans versus rag dolls. I found that many kids don't know what Raggedy Ann is anymore, um, but they might know what a rag doll is. Um, and if you have an example of a rag doll in your office, that's even better. They can do imagery. So I tell kids to imagine floating on clouds, but a lot of times for kids, it's about imagining something that makes them happy. So like eating an ice cream sundae or their favorite place um, in a park, and that can really help to regulate feelings. Um, sensory relaxation is incredibly important in this age group, creating coping kits with your kids um, with different sensory things, smells they like, fabrics they like. Um, I had a little kiddo who loved the feeling of like smooth buttons, or that really smooth feeling, and what he would do is every day going to school, um, they had a little button box, and he would pick the button he wanted to take to school and put it in his pocket, and then when he was getting worried, he'd just stick his hand in his pocket and rub his button. And it was one of those little things that really helped him out in school. And then finally, distraction. Don't underestimate the power of distracting a young child. <laughs> Their brains are really wired to be easily distracted, and we can use that to help them when they get stuck in negative um, feelings. So engaging in positive behaviors, um, oftentimes if they tend to get aggressive when they get dysregulated, I tend to try to find something they can do with their hands. Um, so an opposite behavior, which is from the DBT literature actually with much older people, but opposite behaviors that really, they're competing behaviors. So you can't hit Johnny in the face when you're doing progressive muscle relaxation with your fingers. Those things are incompatible with one another. And then finally, practicing relaxation during periods of calm so then kids are ready to use it when they need to. You can use like the free throw example of if you have to do free throws um, for your basketball team, would you practice them before the game or would you wait till the game for the first time that you have to throw a free throw? And most people can say you'd obviously want to practice beforehand. But remember, parents will likely need to take an active role in helping kids use skills. I rarely meet a child, regardless of their age, that is like jazzed about practicing relaxation skills. Most of them can tell you what relaxation skills are and then they just never want to use them. So what this can do is really help encourage parents to even do things like have this be a reward system. So when your kid practices relaxation, maybe they get to pick the side dish at dinner or maybe they get five minutes added to their bedtime in order to be able to practice relaxation skills which, by the way, nighttime is a great time to practice relaxation skills because it can help them get to bed, and sleep is so important for mood management. So for affect modulation, remember that you may not be able to talk about a huge range of feelings with little children, particularly three-year-olds. The ones I tend to go to, happy, sad, mad, scared, calm. Um, with older children, you might need to get it, you could get into, like, happy versus excited, or mad versus like furious. Because um, you still want to focus on rating intensity, but maybe on a smaller scale. So instead of like a seven point Likert scale, what you may want to do instead is like no happy, some happy, or a lot happy. What I tell kids sometimes is to picture a gumball machine. And is there no happy gumballs in your gumball machine? Is your gumball machine half full of happy gumballs? or is your gumball machine all the way full with happy gumballs? So helping them kind of visualize how to rate intensity. Normalize to people that you can have more than one feeling at the same time. There's a book called Double Dip Feelings that a lot of us use to describe this idea. Um, it's really cute. It says things like it presents a situation that will say, Lisa is somersault happy but um, lost her shoe sad. Like it kind of really gives kids a context for how to rate feelings as well. They may not be able to get through the whole book in one setting, but maybe select a few pages that you think are really applicable for your kid. Tie feelings to traumatic event history. This is gradual exposure. So um, the first time a kid talks about trauma, 
should not be at the trauma narrative. <laughs> that is going to be flooding versus gradual exposure. Instead, you talk about trauma little by little, so that way when we get to the trauma narrative, it's not flooding their system. They're much more ready to be successful. You can use a mirror to practice making feeling faces and recognizing feelings in other people. You can use puppets to act out social stories. Um, so oftentimes I'll have like two dinosaurs in my office and one dinosaur will steal the other dinosaur's toy and we'll talk about what does this dinosaur feel? What does this dinosaur feel? Um, and emphasize parents can do a lot to help kids with their emotional development. You cannot underestimate the importance of parents labeling their own feelings and the feelings that their children are having. So you look mad that this happened or I'm sorry you're feeling sad that your mom didn't come to visit you. So really labeling feelings for kids so that way they don't act out their feelings with their behavior, they can talk out their feelings with their words. Young kids can do the cognitive triangle, okay? <laughs> a lot of people think that that is just way too over the top for little children, but I do believe that young kids can understand the idea that I think things in my head, it changes the way I feel, and it changes how I act. It has to be pretty simplified, though. So use books. There's this series of books called When I'm Feeling. There are these bunny books. Um, I have a little picture of them. Um, they're really, the illustrations are great. I got this from one of the colleagues. Um, one of our interns here in the clinic has used these a lot, and she said she just loves these books. But it talks about when I'm feeling sad, here's what I want to do. And some of the things I want to do are totally appropriate coping strategies, like I want to cry or I want a hug from my mom. And some of them are not the greatest, like I want to punch Timmy in the face. And so they, they help to normalize for kids. You may want to do a whole bunch of things that are appropriate and inappropriate. And then it talks to them about what can you do instead. So those books are really great. Um, Giraffes Can't Dance is another one. Um, it's a book um, that helps kids understand the connection between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. I've done that one with four-year-olds with a lot of success. Um, Thoughts, I tend to tell them, what is your brain telling you? What does your head tell you? Because kids can tend to confuse thoughts and feelings with each other. Most kids can understand that, like, behavior is what my body does, but thoughts and feelings, so if I ask, what are you thinking? They say, I'm thinking I'm sad, which is actually a feeling. So helping them differentiate between those. Um, what I like to do is play a game where I take a piece of paper and we write down a bunch of thoughts, a bunch of feelings, and a bunch of behaviors, and then we tear them up into little... Um, little piece of paper and we actually play charades. So we'll pick it up and then it'll be like sad and I'll have to look sad and then the person will have to get sad and then they'll also have to say that's a feeling. Um, and I have parents involved with this all the time and so you can see your parents getting kind of goofy too. Distortions are often too tricky of a concept for really younger children. Instead what I try to tell them is sometimes your brain fools you. Sometimes your brain has you think stuff that is not necessarily true. Um, and that sometimes the way you think about it isn't the way that other people meant it to happen. But actually getting into like all or nothing thinking versus um, overgeneralization, that might be, it probably is over what they are able to do cognitively. But again, think about this for your individual kids. There are some kids who are pretty advanced, but I've been surprised at what they can pick up at their young age. But the distortions can still be helpful for parents to understand. So even though kids may not understand what all or nothing thinking is, a parent should understand what that is, because I bet they notice the behavior outcomes of a kid who believes in all or nothing thinking. Remember, cognitive coping is the only component in which you don't explicitly bring up trauma, and the reason for that is because you want those distortions to come out in the narrative. Um, and sometimes if you, do, if you talk about them openly in cognitive coping, they may not come out I mean, you may not be able to process them fully then in the narrative. So trauma narratives for all children can take many forms. Um, for young children, timelines are often helpful. And what I try to do is have them think of both positive and traumatic life events. So a fun birthday party at age three, but also the time where um, the neighbor hurt them. Those are both things on their timeline, and it can help them put things into perspective and line things up linearly. So remember, they're just starting to understand time at this age. And so you may need help from parents, too, as, oh, they said they had this fun birthday. Do you remember what year that was? Do you remember what birthday party that was for them? 
and you can actually make a physical timeline for children. Puppet and dollhouse play is really common in this age group. Um, creating a story, and it may be helpful to revisit a book you read during psychoeducation. So with one of my kiddos whose um, dad went to jail, we read The Night Dad Went to Jail um, in the psychoeducation session. We read it again in the feelings modulation, affect modulation session. We read it again before we created the narrative. Remember, kids learn from repetition, um, and that may help them figure out how to start putting words to what they're feeling. Um, remember, the physical product of trauma processing, that's not what the narrative is. <laughs> so the trauma narrative piece is really the process behind creating these ideas. So don't get too caught up in the mechanics of it. And as with older children, you'll want to share the trauma narrative with parents alone as it's created and prepared for the conjoint session. Hearing about trauma that's happened to your child is really hard. I think about hearing about trauma that's happened to your three-year-old and how painful that can be for parents and how much guilt that can accompany about not protecting my children, I wasn't there for my kids, or maybe I um, feel like I had a part in creating this for my children. Um, they need time to process their own feelings. And in order for them to be supportive of their children within conjoint sessions, they need to have processed those feelings. I'm going to go out of order a little bit in the acronym just to talk about the conjoint session because I think it makes the most sense here to talk about. Um, you may need to help a child share their narrative, particularly if parts are written down. So they can maybe show the pictures they've drawn while you read the text, or you can help them understand what each of the parts on their timeline are. Um, just like with older kids, parents should focus on supportive statements. You're so brave. I'm so glad you're telling me your story. Um, so kids know that there's a safe person to tell if future things happen to them as well. And um, we destroy the narrative after we create it, and I think with young kids in particular, they come up with the most creative ways I have ever heard to destroy their narrative. Um, recently, one of my younger kids wanted to create paper airplanes, so each page of the narrative we created into a paper airplane and we flew them into my trash and then they immediately came out of my trash into the shredder right after the session. But he loved it. I mean, that was his way of really bringing this to a close and developing closure. And so I encourage you to try to get kids to think of really creative ways of how to um, destroy their narrative when they're done with it. In vivo desensitization, um, there aren't always trauma triggers that we need to address with in vivo desensitization. Um, but the more common ones in young children that I found with my patients revolve around either separations, because in the past separations were very traumatic, or um, like the dark, or bedtime can be a really scary time. So just like older kids, you'd create a hierarchy of what would be scary, and then you'd go through that hierarchy with kids. You really need parent buy-in to do in vivo desensitization, because a lot of it occurs in the home outside of your sessions. And it's hard for a parent to watch their kid get nervous. And so you would really want to explain to parents and have them be able to explain to you back, why are we doing this? <laughs> and really helping them to understand this, this fear is getting in their child's way. It's impairing them. And overcoming that fear is hard work. Um, also, with in vivo desensitization, focus on creating routines that reassure and provide emotional safety for children. So bedtime routines, separation routines. Um, I have one of my parents with a three-year-old. Um, she gives her kiddo a kiss on her forehead, chin, and both her cheeks every time she drops her off at daycare. Um, things like telling kids, this is when I'm going to see you next. So I'm going to pick you up from daycare after you're done with your afternoon snack, and then we're going to go home and eat dinner together. So giving kids an idea of what's going to happen can really help reduce some of that anxiety. Establishing safety. Um, focus on both physical and emotional safety. So I think we talk a lot about physical safety in terms of safety, I guess, but not a lot about emotional safety. And what I mean by that is a sense of security, a sense of calm, a sense of being taken care of. And that is equally important for kids in order for them to feel safe. Body safety, which is a physical safety component, is an important um, component that actually I tend to use even when kids have not been identified as um, sexual abuse victims. So I tend to do body safety with all my kiddos, and the rationale I talk with parents about is 
I want your kiddos to be prepared. I want them to know the language. If you don't teach your kids, they're learning it. <laughs> it's just a matter of where are they learning it from. And so we talk about private part rules. We talk about identifying your body parts. We use the correct terms with three or four or five-year-olds. Um, and we talk about the idea of no, go, tell. So say no, go, and tell an adult that you trust. And one of the things I focus on kids is, and if that first adult doesn't listen, you tell the next adult, and you tell the next adult until there is an adult who listens. Um, practicing safety plans with kids, going to a grown-up, hiding, calling 911. I focus a lot on role plays for these things. So um, I'll give you an example. I was working with a four-year-old um, who had a lot of domestic violence history in his past, and um, this partner was getting out of jail. And so they were worried a lot about safety. And we actually pushed safety all the way to the front of treatment because safety, of course, was most important in that moment. And we did a role play with him. We talked about what number do you call when you have an emergency? Oh, you call 911. Okay, great. And then what do you tell them? You tell them where you live and what's happening. So if we left it at that, I would have been like, ah, oh, this kid knows where it's at. He knows how to do this. But we decided to role play. And so what I did is I picked up the phone and I said, 911, what's your emergency? And he said, my daddy came in the house and he's not supposed to be here and he's hurting my mom. And I said, okay, where do you live? And he was like, I live in a blue house across the street from the Kellers and we have a dog and we're down the street from a gas station. And that's how kids think about things. Um, and so focusing with kids on how how to do things like know your phone number, know your address, know your parents' phone number um, are really important ideas of physical safety. Finally, terminating services with young children. Um, good goodbyes are really important. So many children, remember, who've experienced trauma find separations to be a trigger. Terminating therapy represents an important separation for many children. And we really have a unique opportunity to provide children and parents, frankly, with good goodbyes. Create memory books, use tangible items. Um, I use the book Invisible String every time I discharge a patient. If you haven't read it yet, I encourage you to do it um, in a place when you're quiet and can kind of tear up and not be judged by your colleagues. Um, but Invisible String is all about how you're connected to the people you love by an invisible string, um, and you can tug at that string when you miss them, and they can tug at that string right back. And helping kids to understand, you know, I do things like in their memory books, giving them a piece of string to remember that we're connected by an invisible string. And if they ever miss me or if I ever think about them, I'll tug on their string to let them know I'm thinking about them. So the take-home messages here is really traumatic experiences in early childhood, they are impactful. So remember to consider trauma diagnoses and evidence-based trauma treatment for these populations. Um, Remember that you need to know about appropriate child development in order to treat young children and help parents to create a trauma-informed and developmentally appropriate perspective. TFCBT is evidence-based for children as young as three years of age. And then finally, young treat child, children, my favorite part of my job actually is they really push you out of your comfort zone. So as a grown-up, it can be hard to interact with young kids because they are silly, they are goofy, they're not embarrassed, they're not self-conscious. And I encourage you, get on the floor, be a lion, do whatever you need to do to help these kiddos um, really cope with what they're going through. Play is a natural form of communication, and you're going to be doing a whole lot of playing. And so that's all I had for you all today in terms of information that I prepared for you um, with implementing TFCBT with preschoolers. I see that we have a few more minutes, and so if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Um, for you now. Okay. Thanks, Safna. Yeah, if you want to use your chat feature to type in a question, we will wait um, for a few minutes here, and then um, after some questions, we will. I'll go to the next slide with the information about the CEUs. Maybe this might be a question that some of you have. A lot of times we get asked about um, 
getting a copy of the PowerPoint and stuff, and I will, if that's something you want, just, just let me know, email me, and I can send it out to, Absolutely. to folks. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions that come up over the weekend or in future, I'm happy to pass those along to Sufna. And you know, some of the strategies we talked about today um, aren't necessarily TFCBT exclusive. Um, what I find is that frac skills are really an awfully good way to treat a whole lot of disorders. <laughs> And so um, just a thought, um, you can use a lot of these techniques in other evidence-based treatments and other treatments you're doing for kids as well. Um, Glenna, if you have a question, if you wouldn't mind typing that in, just clicking on that chat bubble and writing your question. We'll kind of hang out and see if you have a question. That's a great question. So um, Robin just asked, how do you get value options to recognize that a three-year-old can do therapy? Um, okay, so we have um, PA forms, that's the prior authorization forms. We have PA forms that we use that explicitly talk about TFCBT is an evidence-based strategy for three-year-old children who have experienced trauma and are manifesting adjustment-related difficulties. Um, TFCBT is a dyadic treatment that requires current participation. Therefore, we're not going to be having these individual therapy sessions with three-year-olds. These are going to be family sessions. And we talk a whole lot about the impairment and how TFCBT addresses those things. So we actually haven't had too much of a problem getting value options to recognize, um, but it takes a little bit of work on our part in terms of prior authorizations. Good question, Robin, and if you kind of follow up, I'm happy to maybe connect you and Stephanie together to kind of talk about that. Absolutely. Um, there's another. <laughs> I'm happy that Valley Options loves TFCBT. We love TFCBT here as well. Um, we have another question about what treatments would you recommend for children who are younger or developmentally younger than three? Um, there are two other treatments that we use quite a bit within our clinic um, called child parent psychotherapy, which is CPP. That's for um, really, really young children. I think the youngest child we've had in our clinic using CPP was six months of age. Um, and parent-child interaction therapy has also been evidence-based to reduce disruptive behaviors in children who have experienced trauma. And so those are the two we tend to go to the most um, when kids are developmentally younger than three years of age. Um, and continue to write a question or two, and we can hang out. I did want to get to the CU slide. So the code word or phrase for today is three to five. Um, remember that you can send that to me in email. And if someone is at your office listening in but didn't necessarily sign in, they will have to email me as well um, individually. Otherwise, I won't be able to give them a CU credit. So make sure you do that if you're listening in or um, on the same computer as one of your coworkers. So. We're happy to just hang out for a few more minutes and take questions. Otherwise, you all have a great weekend, um, and I'm glad there's such a high turnout today. So we'll just kind of sit by, and if there's any other questions, we will um, answer those. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, to get a copy of the PowerPoint slides, I'll probably just send an email out to everyone with the, with the PowerPoint on it. So. All right, last call for questions, and then we're going to sign off and um, enjoy the rest of Friday. All right, well, if you have any uh, other questions, feel free to uh, send me an email, and I will connect them to folks who know more about that than I do. So <laughs> everyone have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.